Well, welcome everyone. Uh, this is uh, Double Consciousness of Two Prayers and uh, with, with Joel Millman, who I've known <laughs> for a little while now. Um, first, I knew her as someone who came in and said hello on a random phone call visit to Dernister, but then I found out that she's in fact also a well-studied poet who agreed to contribute to our newsletter, which somehow morphed from um, a synagogue newsletter to a version, some sort of literary journal, and a lot through what she's been writing, which is this epic of a character going through the Haftarah portions um, in uh, and and casting and casting new light on on all of it and uh and I, I mean it's become something that i'm very proud of and i'm very grateful that joelle has brought her talents to uh, to make something out of um and uh and right now she lives in tel aviv she is finishing her masters at uh, hebrew university in jerusalem and is beginning her work at Breaking the Silence, uh, the Israeli Peace Advocacy Organization. And so with that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to you to it, Joel, to introduce a, a couple of your poems from the from the cycle and just read them and um, and then we'll and then we'll get into it. Um, yes, thank you so much, Zach. And um sorry dealing with the zoom um thank you all so much for being here this is an absolute joy for me to be doing this um i want to say thank you at the beginning and at the end and all the way through to zach and Dernister for being such a home and a great space and for giving me this opportunity it's been a joy upon joy so i'm having a great time um so this is a poetic cycle that's based on the weekly haftorah readings which is um selections um that are read in synagogue and shul every week um selected from the nevi'im from the book of the prophets um it's such a cool project i'm having the best time um i love writing them and i can't wait to share so i'm going to be reading two poems from the cycle right now we're at 20 poems i think well, me and Zach agreed upon, it's going to be 24 by the end. Um, maybe I'll extend it. I'm having a lot of fun. And I want to invite you all, if you would like, to read along with me. Um, I'm putting the poems in the chat. It's in an open document. Um, you're welcome to take a read if you like. And this is also this document is also um, open for comments. So I just want to invite you all to comment on the poems if you want. I think it'd be really cool if it was a sort of collaborative document. Um, and in the spirit of um, Tanakh and like Torah readings, I think it would be cool to have commentary, um, which I think is really exciting. Um, okay, I'm going to read some poems. Let's see. Um, all right. The first one is from Yermiyahu. Far from sea, I'm stumbling along the little rocks of the foothills of Jerusalem, hills nestled between Zatar when suddenly God appears and stuffs words down my mouth, fills me up to brim, my seams exploding with words she put in my plush body, saying, see, I appoint you this day over nations and kingdoms to uproot and to pull down to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. He left me thus, stuffed, written. Full, I waddled through the landscape, overstuffed with greens and trapped in a cocoon of God's words, I turned pink and sunbeams. I want none of this, I think, tripping over craggly dusts. I'd rather take these words and make music. Instead, they gestate in my belly of fur, curdling olives into wine. Words make me hot, I'm sweating, a mirage appears, one lone olive tree, thank Hashem, I sit with my face buried in the leaves to meditate. Hmm, 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 love my mouth. And when and when deep enough into the purple I look, I see the given visions, the almond branch flowering pink through the three week days of mourning. A pot of brass tipping oils from the north of violence is coming to near to illuminate these visions and I don't want to bear them, I scream alone in the hyssops. Give me a friend to share burden to, I'm overstuffed and the desire is to dance and God, where are the angels? Can they help me please? 
My visions shake my body, nerves enervating skin outwards, radiation and meditations. I want, I want the friendly face of God, a rechampin of joy and flourishing, gracious face that lets me entrance to gentle tear of finger that strokes the mucus of such tender blood, the type of God who wants people to love again through bullets, to thrive and open their mouths and gates to others, not God who stuck me taxidermy with words and made me a fortress no one can enter. I want to open, so I pray, again, pathetic. I pray if there are 20 righteous souls in the land, if there is a minion of the righteous, a single soul of the righteous, and you know what, even the unrighteous deserve to eat the olive branch. My eyes snap to a cord, and as I pray, words spill out of me, I get lighter. And I ask the tree if I can take the branch, and eat the leaves of grass all around the tree, and chew my cud three times, and vomit up the grasses, and they are all covered in all the words, they are purged. And naked raw, thus a hand from air is offered, an ace falling from the sky, my friend, the angel, who helps me stand up and dot, dot, dot. And um, this is the first one um, that I'll read today. And they all lead into each other. And the next one is from Mishiahu. And it's actually a sonnet, if that's of relevance to anyone. I just love writing sonnets. <sighs> It seems the temple's highest priest wants to have me mourning from the mountain perch of stones where I'm meant to hear God roaring. But the moss snores, but the moss snores loudly too. If you stoop your knees to glisten, brush your chest against the groundscape as you prostrate and just listen. Giggling are the dewdrops, effluviums bring the spores. Jellyfish puff through mist, leaves erect their funny pores. Toadstools and the sand pools host these micro parties, which, if you listen dearly closely well, you may be blessed to kiss. God is mad we've done it wrong, scorched the earth, gave cronies song. God says, we forgot the ox, each heart is sick, this wine is wrong. I wonder if I prostrate and make use of my big nose, I can give my smells to heaven, simple trick to cool God's woes. <laughs> it's the end of that um thank you joel the the um you know i i always i remember getting caught out on the uh on the big nose when i first read it as yeah. that has a great theological significance to me personally uh <laughs> which i'll get into later well um so first of all thank you very much uh, for sharing these and for reading I don't think I've ever heard you read them before and uh, and to, and because you're so visual in the style of how you write that you break up the text and in certain ways it's it's actually a sometimes it's not such a different experience to hear them read versus to see them but because there is no approximate way to uh, to say like the way you break up a text it's it, it is a very different experience um the first question i have is um and we're, we're going to open it up to uh uh more everyone else's questions once we uh we get the ball rolling here is what is the relationship of these poems to the prophets uh, could you sort of break them down and uh and and, ex and explain also your relationship to the prophets yeah, for sure. So these poems to the prophets, essentially what this cycle has become for me over the past 20 weeks or so. Um, what's so cool about the prophets and about the way the structure of the weekly Haftorah reading um, works is that we get this weekly cycle, like the story continues and continues and continues. And for me, it this project felt like a really exciting opportunity to sort of continue the story, like to enter the plot lines and keep playing and keep engaging and, and keep what's happening in the prophets um, going in so many different ways. So what happened with these poems is I created this sort of character, maybe autofictional, my relationship to autofiction is ambivalent, but maybe autofictional, maybe me, maybe not me. And this character sort of enters the stories of the prophets and messes things around, right? She's engaging with the plot. She's seeing the plot and she's walking away. She's yelling at God. Most of the time she's yelling at God. Actually, this is her main activity. Um, she's wrestling, she's fighting, she's getting her period, she's lying down, like, but she is in these stories fully. Um, and what's so cool about the Haftorah is that it invites you, it is a continuous cycle, right? It happens again and again, week after week. Um, but what's cool about the Haftorah is that 
there's no continuity really between the stories. Like every week, it's a totally different selection from a totally different part of Nevi'im, um, which is the books of the prophet. So it's almost like I have this character and every week I bring her back up into this spaceship and then she gets beamed back onto earth to go or into these stories to interact with whatever's happening in the prophet. And then she goes back up and she goes back down, um, which is why it's been so cool to write these as um, an epic, which was your framing, Zach. I didn't think of these as an epic until you said that, but I left every, the end of every poem leads directly to the next poem. So it's like one ongoing sentence, um, which is really cool to me because it's brought this added level of continuity between these stories that are both continuous and discontinuous at the same time. So this character is like really playing with these stories. Um, as I for noticed, and I noticed that the characters is, even though she's, um, so just to oh, give an overall bigger framing of the way the character is acting is that you mentioned that she's um, she's engaging with a lot of different activities that are both um, the way a, a character in the prophets should act and many of them in which that she probably shouldn't or are just ordinary things like um, I don't know I think that you had a lot of like very playful language especially in the sonnet um and but but these are all actually um really contiguous with prophetic figures like that they they all did all manner of things to to that and that, that gave them all legitimacy um what's your sort of take on um the way your character sort of expands um her her presence in in the various activities she does and the way you see the prophets doing that and what, what do you hope to get from that yeah thank you that's such a cool question um I feel like something I've really discovered from this project is that the prophets were really weird <laughs> um they're really weird they're doing a lot of weird things like Yechezkel Ezekiel is like he's very kinky like it's a really weird book um you know one of them you know um, I think it's Micha goes and wakes up someone from the dead, like someone, you know, there's a story of Abishag, a young virgin is brought to lie with King David, like there are so many weird things that are happening in these stories, which I think gave me, me as a writer, so much freedom to just do whatever I wanted with these texts, but still consider them absolutely legitimate, right? Like I can be part of this story as much as anyone else. This is my tradition. This is my language. This is where I come from. Um, uh, but yeah, I could just sort of like loop de loop around with these stories and, and play with them. And another part of the prophets and a part of the Jewish tradition that's so exciting to me is that it can be read so many different ways. I mean, that's, I mean, I think any of us who've spent time with text knows that half of the fun of exegesis or whatever is debating over what anything actually means, right? Um, which also gave me so much freedom. And this is one of the first times that I've let myself not read every single commentator on a text, you know, like in the past, whenever I wanted to write uh, Devar Torah or like share anything related to Torah or Tanakh, I would make sure to read up everything I could. I wanted all the legitimacy of all the rabbis to sort of back me up. And this time I was just like, fuck that. You know what I mean? These prophets are weirdos. They are doing weird stuff. And if they are saying their prophecy is legitimate, then my little poetry can be legitimate, right? Like, why not? Um, so, it was so freeing and so fun. And I think I think reading Yechezkel was specifically a moment where this where this feeling of legitimacy came to me, um, just because it opens on the first person, like the first word is ani in Hebrew. And I my mind was blown. I think I walked out of my house and back into my house. I was like, he's just saying, God came to me, God came to I. And I was like, okay, like, let's go. Like, why, why would I be hiding from any of this at all? Um, was that your question? I feel like I got no, it. No, that was that was that was precisely it. I mean, and I want to get into this a little further. Um, mm -hmm. There are a lot of. They're almost kind of like, well, well. There's a lot of talk about childbirth in 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 the prophets, yeah. and like a lot of really strong imagery that's not really used in the rest of um, really the Jewish canon. There are a lot of strong female figures, including ones that um poke an ice pick into a general's head uh, at one point I'm like yeah L. um there's deborah um and the 
profit and and there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of room there's a lot of space that the that the world of the prophets takes up that's not really understood to be part of our tradition that you not only walk into but you actually expand in even newer directions of not necessarily the meaning of 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 what counts as being close to god but just like what is although you did talk about Sorry to be a little confusing. You did talk about that expanding the directions of ways you can be as as being closer to God in ways that are untraditional. Um, anyway, it, is there is there is that a jumping off point that uh, that yeah. For us? I, I think so. I mean, it's like an honor to even think I could be expanding anything in any way. <laughs> Just that's so cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think like something that happens a lot in these poems, actually specifically after the sonnet, um, which interesting. So like I said, these what I read tonight are two out of 20 poems. They're number seven and eight. And starting with number eight comes seven poems all from Isaiah, um, because there are seven weeks where we read Isaiah between, I think, Tisha B'Av and um, the Chagim, the High Holidays. Um, so I got really trapped in Isaiah. It actually drove me crazy because it was beautiful language. It's totally beautiful, but it's very repetitive and very cyclical, which A was, I think, good because the prophetic cycle is recurring. So it brought me to a specific mindset, which I appreciate. But also it gave me even more freedom within my even free project. I was like, okay, here's a bunch of cool language. It's saying the same thing it said again. Let me re-scramble this. I was like a DJ just going off or a jazz improv improvisation it's just like playing whatever music came to mind and riffing off things together um so yeah so it was really fun oh so one um image that comes up again and again and you know this is pretty close to my real life is the character is like constantly smelling the grass and like shoving her face in trees <laughs> my mom's smiling um you know it's a character who's constantly like touching earth and like finding the little face of God in a little butterfly and then saying fuck you to all the men across the street who are building a road through the mountain right like this dichotomy gets set up stronger and stronger throughout the poetry um especially in I think the seven poems that have to do with Isaiah so um yeah it's cool to be able to expand upon that language I, I like how you phrase that um and I think it's also part of this character who's really She's fighting with God, but she's fighting with God because God is there. Like the, the presence of God or Ruach, who I, I use mostly Ruach, God, and Hashem as three different names for God in these poems. Um, the presence is not questioned. Like that's not, that's not the problem. The problem is why are things happening this way um, according to this faith of God? And why are, why are people acting this way according to like, if God is here, why are people acting this way? And I mean, these are the questions of the prophets, right? I didn't make them up. They're age old. <laughs> They're the same ones. Um, well, actually, you could you could you expand on that? Like, how is how is the character continuing the project of the prophets? And in what way does she, if any, does she deviate? I mean, wow, an honor. Um, yeah, she's wrestling with God. I don't know. Like, isn't that the the easter oh that's the whole thing right like how do you how do you wrestle um you know what's that story from the talmud i might be like butchering it that like like the the jews the israelites or whatever are are trying to interpret a halacha and god comes in and tries to tell him tell god comes and tries to say god's perspective and the people are like no no, no don't talk to us like we're busy interpreting this for ourselves um I don't know exactly where that's from. It's a great story, maybe. Oh, Loba Shemayim, yeah. That's yeah, yeah, Loba Shemayim. Yes. Yeah, so I feel like that's sort of the, the project in, in a sort of existential way, but what's cool about the prophets and from this journey that I've taken in and out through the Haftorah is that they are not in the sky and they're not only with God, they're interacting with what's happening on earth and with the people around them and how the people around them are reacting and and treating the earth and the other people on the earth. And, and you could read this in many ways, right? You could take this prophecy in many different directions. Um, you know, you can choose bits and pieces. There, you, there are a million ways to interact with Jerusalem through the prophets, but um, I don't know. I think for me also living in Israel and doing living the life that I do, it, it felt like, okay, if they were walking around Israel, seeing things happen, what am I walking like? What am I walking around like? Like the landscapes that are happening 
in the profits are the same landscapes that I take the train back and forth on every single day. Like it's literally the same earth. So whether or not, like, you know, we were talking about legitimacy earlier, but whether or not it's legitimate, it, it's like, this is the place. So I might as well ask the questions and, and have that battle, I guess. You know? Yeah, and I want to go into that, more of that question. Um, now that you're beginning to work with uh, Breaking the Silence, uh, which is very much a work of being inside of a system rather than outside to criticize it as it happens. Um, and it's also, it, it's all, there's also a commonality in that um, a, a lot of the people who use violence in the wrong kind of way are really actually basing a lot of their ideas on the prophets. And you're also going inside the prophet, even though you have, like, you expand maybe their, their touch into, I don't, I, actually, it's not really fair to say you're, you're expanding their touch into silliness, because I'm pretty sure Ezekiel at some point makes a diorama out of his own poop uh, to <laughs> represent, <laughs> you, so, which is completely different and not um, as refreshing as smelling grass, but I mean, like, uh, but, but they're using the prophets. Uh, you know, a lot of the people who, and, and you're going into the prophets and, and delving into a very deep, and, and I think you get, you describe to me as like, it, it's more of an internal exploration of the prophets. Um, and it's something that can give you legitimacy just on an internal standing by the way you like walk around the land and see things. But I, maybe that's, that that's too easy of a, of an explanation, I don't know. Yeah, it's a nice way to put it. I mean, I'm I'm skeptical. I I mean, first of all, this this whole cycle started before I even started the application for this job process. So like, there's a, a limited amount to like it. It's part of my life, but it's also like upcoming thesis before I you know do anything else. Um, but yeah, I mean. I don't know, like I, I'm I'm both excited by and skeptical about whatever role poetry can play in the political process. It's a huge question I have. Um, there's this one great press that describes poetry like the barking dog at the edge of the protest, um, just making noise and making itself present, but not actually contributing anything to uh, you know, the cause, which I think is really interesting. I don't, I think that's a phrase that's worth debating and thinking and sitting with. Um, I feel like these poems, you know, I almost feel like I can't speak for their political saliency or their relevance in this fight. They just have to go speak for themselves and people can do with them what they want. You know, like they're a little heretical. It's true. There's one line that says, I take Shabbos and break it in two and shove it up, shove it up my shirt sleeves. And now it's impure, just like me, something like that. And I, I love that line, right? Like take Shabbos, break it and carry it with you everywhere. I, I love that for me, that's very religious for other people. That's not Orthodox, right? Well, so I mean, that, that's very much like the way the Jews were supposed to carry the broken tablets. Mm, like, nice. That's supposed to be part of the tab, the Holy Tabernacle carrying the tablets. So like, yes, that is very religious. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't even think about that. But yeah, that's totally there. I mean, I think that's the point, right? It's all it's all there. And if everything is there, including Ezekiel building piles of poop and rolling around in a straight jacket in a pile of bones, which is like a true image. I didn't make that up. Um, that comes from Ezekiel. Like it's all there. So now this is also there. So what does that mean? How does that change the equation for anyone? Maybe it only changes the equation for me. Maybe it only changes the equation for me and you, Zach. Maybe it changes the equation for two people in this Zoom room. But I don't know. Like, I don't know. I, it has to do its own work, if that makes sense. I don't know. So I have, I have a couple more questions for you before I open it up the floor. Um, the first one is, uh, there's a lot of, there's of course like a lot of conflict in these poems um, between the character and God, not really so much with other, other people. Um, and yeah. a lot of the time, well, a lot of the conflicts sometimes stem from your life, sometimes stem from your perspective. Um, and actually very interestingly, they stem from a conflict between yourself and like the halakhic castle 
uh, of which you sometimes like exist within and without. Um, can you speak more about like it's not not to what extent there are internal battles within yourself that are expressed in these and to what extent that these are just sort of divorced from that and existing for the sake of existing um yeah interesting question i actually feel like the character is not so frustrated by herself i don't think she's like existentially mad at herself i think sometimes she's just wondering like about God. Like, I actually think it's a really interesting point. She's not really in conflict with other people so much, um, except for all the random men that she walks away from and the angels that she hangs out with and considers her friends. And here and there, a single character maybe appears or disappears. Um, but I don't think those poems are published. But um, yeah, I, but I think her conflict is, like I said, her conflict is with, with, with God and why is it this way? And you know, what, yeah, like, why, God, why? <laughs> like, that's, that's the, that's sort of the, the question of it, and what you, what Zach was referring to for the other people in this room is I often talk about, um, um, like, when I first started really studying Talmud, I was sort of intrigued by the fact that it didn't feel like it was for me, because I'm a cisgender woman, like, I'm, like with the rules and realities of my femininity, like I don't have to do time vote mitzvot, right? There are so many things that aren't just aren't written for me and aren't relevant for me. Um, but I still had the keys. So I described it to Zach once and to some friends. It's almost like when I go into halacha or when I go into tradition, it's like I have the keys to the castle, but none or most of the rules and restrictions of the castle don't actually apply to me. Right, like I can actually kind of do whatever I want. The kitchen doesn't close for me, right? The kitchen is open and I can go cook whatever I want or I can go, uh, you know, play in the library at like 3 a.m. No one no one really cares. No one's, uh, I'm in charge of how I access the castle. Um, so yeah, so I feel like these poems were sort of an expansion on that in a way. Like I'm just gonna let myself into the story and into Tanakh and give myself full power to play around and have fun. And then one last question before, and uh, yes, please write questions in the chat or, or just I'll call on you or just raise your hand or, or start talking after, after this last one is you spent a long time studying form of how to write poetry and like specific things that you do or, or you're taught to do. Um, what, what specifically should we be clued in on in what you've written or even what you just brought to share with us today? And how, and is there also um, a, a what, a, I, th I think we discussed as like a conflict with the with the with the rules and the systems of of writing themselves. Like, um, is there a certain freedom you feel in in writing these? However, um, so anyway, something more on the on the lines of like math of of the English language and how and how it rolls down on us. Yeah, I like I said, I just had so much fun with these poems. I let myself rip. And also, you know, I was writing, I'm still writing. It's a weekly poem. So it's not like, I wouldn't call these poems drafts, but they're not the most, you know, tight, polished poems of all time. <laughs> they're, they're kind of messy. They're kind of sloppy. Um, I'm, no, not sloppy, but, you know, I, I make, I have typos. Anyone who's, uh, you know, who knows me or who texts with me is laughing at my, iconic typos. Um, so <laughs> I had a great typo today. Um, I meant to say I contain multitudes and I wrote I contagion multi-user, which was a really good one. <laughs> um, but anyway, in regards to form, yeah, I let myself go wild. Um, yeah, I texted that to Ari Gordon, who just replied in the chat. Um, but yeah, so first of all, I played a lot with where do I want to put words on the page. Um, every poem is slightly different. Every poem has sort of its own rules that I follow. There's one poem that's, you know, three pages of um, tersets, which is sets of three lines. Um, like I said, one of these is a sonnet. Um, this one over here, the, um, the one at the end is a sonnet. This one over here is sections. And I really let myself sort of almost 
scat, like almost like jazz, like this section felt like it needed to be a little bit more stretched out and it needed more space because the person, the character, the speaker is hot, she's hot and sweating and, you know, she lands under a tree to meditate. So what would that look like on the page? Um, and I really just let myself do it. I mean, I think that these, these capital letters, I don't want to bear them is actually like, I would never do that, but I did it. Like, I, I feel weird about them, but I also like them. Like I've had way more in conflict without these capital letters than I probably should have. Um, Cause it, that's not like a necessarily a classy thing to do in poetry, but whatever. Like I gave myself freedom, which was a huge gift. So I let myself take that freedom and run with it. Um, I definitely feel like the stanza is the basis of these poems. Like the stanza is, means room in Italian and it's like the, the block of text. Um, most of these poems, I feel like a lot of my writing, usually my stanzas have their own internal logic and I break things into stanzas a lot. I, I'm saying that off the cuff, but I think it's true. Um, and yeah, I just went wild and I really, like I played. There's a lot of, um, you know, I actually really, I've been, you know, something I don't know that I really want to lo learn and a friend of mine in this room, Hi, Lainey, is offered to teach me. Like, I don't know how to read trope and I really want to learn to read trope. But I feel like one attempt that I used to sort of make up for that was like really rhythmic language that was really moving along the beat, that was up and down, that had sound to it. Um, yeah. And like, you know, I played a lot with homonyms because that's a very, um, that's a very uh, sort of biblical thing to do, right? Like there's bear and bear, loins and lions, right? It's very midrashic that the midrash will come and take one word and say, oh, it sounds like this other word and thus it has 30 meanings to it. Um, so I let myself roll with that. Um, and yeah, but really like, I, I think the best metaphor for this whole project is just like improv jazz. Like I'm just in a way, there's an element of riffing to them. Um, which is really fun, like years of study to just like let myself let it rip in the moment, if that makes sense. So I think I think that's a very prophetic way of approaching it all. So, <laughs> um, uh, can you read the uh, question in the chat? Um, sure. And I want to say, uh, I guess, as we move to this like question part, thank you all so much for being here and listening to me. It's like the dream of my whole life is this. So, and I really want to hear your voices. So like, feel free to take off mute and ask questions and discuss and whatever. Um, Risha, Risha says, um, I was wondering if you revisit the places the prophets were to feel what they were feeling. Do their works and your interpretation of them, have they changed you and your perspective of them? A hundred percent. And I'm also still really deep in it. Um, like I'm still writing these poems. I'm not finished yet. I'm still in this land. Um, like they're definitely happening. I feel like I haven't intentionally set out to visit the places where these poems are happening. I just live here. <laughs> like they're just, happening here. I mean, one thing that's interesting is Yechezkel, Ezekiel, which I've mentioned a few times, it takes place not in Israel, but in a place called Tel Abib, not Tel Aviv, but it's like Abib, which is so funny because I'm in Tel Aviv, which is Israel, but it's like a little bubble. So I really had fun reading that and being like, oh, he's, he's outside of Israel, but part of this Israelite canon. And what is it? Maybe I can engage with that too. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, Saba. Hi, Saba. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask a question slash comment slash open a discussion about those typos you were talking about, the iconic typos, and how they <laughs> seem to like, like you were talking about how this is kind of like riffing, like jazz, like play. And it's interesting how those typos can almost open a door to another interpretation which you didn't even think about or like a another thought that you had even like just popped out of the blue because the computer autocorrected or something um so i think that's an interesting um i haven't seen anybody else really use typos or use the computer as a collaborator in those little moments so i, I just wanted to to say that that's super interesting and um i admire your work yeah thank you thanks Ava. um yeah definitely sometimes things come up and i just leave it there i'm like interesting like whose hand was this was it the hand of god was it the hand of whatever let it just let and it i'm just it. Want, and i just want to add since i 
am technically the editor of these for the newsletter. I <laughs> never correct anything except I think one time I was like this. This is not even an unintentional typo. This is like out of and I think I did it once. Everything else, I'm like, this isn't this is this is the way she wants it. End of story. Yeah. I I admit I've looked back on some of these poems and I've sometimes thought maybe I could polish them or like I I it's interesting to think about even going back and looking at them, just thinking about this event was an interesting experience to sort of see like, oh, what there were interesting moments when I was like, oh, that could have been much tighter, which which is cool. I, and part of the joy of this process was that Zach and Henry and Dernister like offered this space where I could put poems out in this stage. I feel like usually we only see poems that are so polished and so finished that you don't get any of the little mess or any of the questions. And, and that was really, I don't know, so exciting to me. Like, let's have a little bit of that too, right? Like if we have an abundance mindset, there's room for poems that, you know, can hold hold that kind of stuff. So yeah. Yeah. Like, can I respond? Hey, to Saba's um, comment. It's interesting because, oh, hello, my name's Hila. Um, it's interesting you raise that because I, I've, I studied some Bible at Hebrew University and there's a whole category that hones in on scribal mistakes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, you know, there's a lot of different study of what, you know, if it was originally like one letter, but then they didn't draw the line fully or didn't. And so it's just interesting. Sometimes there are bodies of commentary that flow from an assumption of what was an originally a mistake. So there's a lot of different, you know, the, the sages in particular, they love to like spot a certain letter and then create a whole story behind it of, oh, it means that God's present in that story or it doesn't mean this. And it, it, it probably was very much just a mistake. So it's, it's, I think it's so interesting that you put yourself in conversation with the history of like beautiful things being kind of forged from, from mistakes. Um, and then my question, I also had a question, which if I can veer the conversation a little bit, but but we could also also talk more about what Saba raised, was when I read the poems and also when I, I heard you speaking about them, I wondered if you had ever thought of, you know, you talk of, even the way you speak about this speaker of the poem, this focalizer, this protagonist, you know, you, she, she's your focalizer in so many ways. And I was wondering if you thought of her as your prophet in some ways. Mm. I mean, not to give you a God complex, because I think that's that. like the last thing that like millennials need. But like, you know, <laughs> you know, she's out there in the world and she's, you know, trying to digest what she sees and understand and, you know, kind of translate all the different things that she has around her and this womb of life experience and liturgy and and so forth. Uh, and she and she's trying to make sense of it. And, and you could say that's what a prophet does as well. So I'm curious, are these your prophets? Have you made a prophet? Are you God? <laughs> no, definitely not. Uh, wow, I'm like shivering at that question. I mean, uh, cool. I think mate, like what, what an honor if I could ever get anything close to anything like that. Um, I feel like, ee, like these poems have to stand on their own. I will say that like, I don't really know who I am when I write them like I don't really I just write them and then I kind of disappear and forget about them um even this like last week's poem I thought that because I was doing all this prep work for this event that the poem would get strange or maybe it would be like manipulated by all this work and then it ended up being a very honest poem not even about my contemporary emotion about some emotion I was feeling like two weeks ago like it ended up being a really honest poem that I sort of like I was like, oh, I don't know where that came from. Interesting. So I don't know. I, I wouldn't go so, I don't know. In terms of are these a profit for me? I don't know if I could ever answer that. But like, if you want them to hold that space for you as a reader, then you are allowed to do whatever you want. Like the poems can be yours and, and you can just take them and, and, and do whatever you want with them. And I would be only so honored to be, you know, in those ranks but you know what is the profit anyway they're just kind of like dirty and rolling around in the mud so 
you know. And uh, Joe, we have a question in the chat. You want to read it? Uh, I'd rather not. Oh, Ari, do you want to you want to say it to us? I um, I can read it, but I also just kind of like want, okay, I'll read it and then I'll just like. I realize it's not that clear, even though I just sent it in the spirit of Joelle just sending off her poems. Um, I wrote, you bring in so much rhyme and form, hello sonnet, and you're working within such a specific topical set of deriving each poem specifically from like the biblical mythology of every week. And I wanna know where your voice, of course, all of these poems are your voice, but where is Joelle in these poems? Where is your rage in these poems? Where is your desire, your silliness? Um, your freeness, how much are you channeling through a specific character versus um, that having that character channel through you? Um, how does the speaker here diverge or merge with your own specific Joelle voice? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, as I sort of mentioned, I feel like, I don't know, my relationship to autofiction is ambivalent meaning both I absolutely love it and I'm also kind of like turned off by it, which is maybe, I don't know, relatable for any tool we use that's also somewhat like trending <laughs> or my, just my relationship to trending things. Um, I don't know, I almost feel like you could kind of go line by line. Like there are some moments when I feel like, oh yeah, maybe that's a little bit more Joelle, the writer. I mean, I also wonder if like, you know, and I think this is something that maybe spoken about, like the division between you know, the speaker and the writer, like maybe that's a bit too binary. Like maybe we need to move beyond that. Like maybe we're a little bit trapped in that. Like it's very much in some ways a creation of like modern workshops to be like, oh, the speaker is experiencing something. Um, or like, what about the writer? The writer was also there. So I don't know where I end and this character begins. I don't know if this, I don't think this character is really named Joelle. You know, I think also this character, <laughs> caves to her more like base emotions more than I do. I don't know if that's true. I might allow myself <laughs> all my base emotions, but um, you know, I think also like, you know, I think one interesting moment actually for that question might just be rage because there these poems are full of rage. I'm raging um, all the time in them and in my life, I don't know if I rage that often. Um, I rage at, people who park in the bike lane on a consistent basis. But other than that, um, <laughs> yes, other than that, I don't think I'm like raging so much. So I feel like maybe the rage in these poems is a place where perhaps Joelle the writer comes out more, but I'm a little, I'm a little unsure. I don't know if, you know, and I feel like maybe I can only answer that like in a year looking back. I'm gonna push back a little and ask a follow-up, which is what kinds right. of emotions were you processing while you were channeling the speaker through these poems? what what in you did you have to access what in you did you have to dig through because there is a lot that's happening here um and i can hear you here right so like what were there some things that you had to shut off were there some things that you were like oh i'm gonna actually tap into that and actually that's like a political conversation i've been having or actually that's something i've been thinking about theoretically or uh, like where where did you tap into yourself in order to get these poems out Oh, what a cool question. Thank you. Um, rage. <laughs> Definitely that rage. Um, and it's, it's intimate rage, right? Because I'm raging at and with and for and against and together, you know, in the dirt with God. So, uh, or Ruach. And Definitely the rage. I mean, I think a lot of the things that I'm processing just have to do with living in Israel, Palestine and being a politically engaged person, um, being part of the communities that I'm part of, both communities that I come from and the communities that where I'm active, um, holding both of those spaces, navigating them. It's um, not so simple. I'm grateful for everyone in this room who's, you know, been with me and who's with me in both of those spaces. Um, so I feel like these poems maybe engage in that, but these poems maybe do take it a little bit out of the realm of the human and more just into like me and Hashem, like, why? <laughs> why? You know, but well, if I'm here, Joelle, saying to you guys, like, why in the poem, she's shaking her fist and like beating her chest in the waves in Jaffa. Like she's going all out um, in ways that I, you know, you can't, you know, it's unfortunate that we can't all engage in our rage like that necessarily. But then, you know, 
I live in a place where there's a lot of violence and I wonder what can the poet do in the face of violence? Uh, a question that I really want to discuss. So if any of y'all have any ideas, like. And the, there's a further question in the chat. Mm. I should open the chat. Oh, hello, Christian. What is the prophetic for you in relation to the poetic slash the lyrical? Where do these personae practices ethoi meet? Where do they take leave of each other? Where do they clash and yell at each other? Oof. This is such a great question. Thank you, Christian. It's um, a very general question. <laughs> yeah, it's it's general, but it's also, I mean, it makes me think about like the tradition of the lyric you know, and how different poets, I mean, I think it's interesting because if you look at, you know, the history of poetry or poetic tradition, which I'm like spent way too much time doing, different eras have different relationships to God or like the almighty or the creator or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, there's a long time when poetry is like kind of about God and then it's kind of about love and then it's kind of about industry, you know. Um, and I'm, I'm saying that because I feel like there is a tendency, you know, but okay, I think this is my answer. I feel like poets love writing about their process of writing poetry. Like there are so many poems that end up being about poetry. And I think a lot of these poems also talk about writing poetry because the prophetic is a form of poetry as well, right? Um, it's a form of lyric. You know, I don't know. I think it's like, I, I wonder at the distinction I wonder if I, I have to think about this question more. I wonder if there even is a distinction between the poetic and the prophetic as I'm conceiving of them, but it seems to me that there must be some sort of distinction. Like they're not the same thing, but I guess I'm kind of conceiving it as the same thing. Um, I guess one other way that I could take this, and I'm really just going off the cuff. So also Christian, feel free to like ask a follow-up or push me somewhere, but um Oh, shoot, I lost my train of thought. Oh, I got it back. Uh, for me, I think maybe in some ways the prophetic is a bit more intimate, I wonder. Um, I don't know if that's entirely true. I have to think about that, but there, there's something there that maybe the poetic or, and, and maybe that's because the prophetic, and like I said, this is my tradition that I'm claiming as my tradition that I can do whatever the fuck I want with, you know? So, sorry, strong language, yeah. Did that answer your question or do you have a, I, I would love to hear your thoughts in general, as always. There are no wrong questions and no wrong answers. No, I was just wondering about the relationship because at least uh, from what I know about Western poetry, uh, and many, many times the poetic has been conceived of that, which, uh, you know, comes after the prophetic uh, when God is dead and all you have left are these poets who are desperate, you know, to become prophets and uh, so if it's about the question of authority and how you not about so much about legitimacy, but about how you are your own author and how you can claim authority within society, not just in literature. And that's why I ask. And also perhaps, and that's something you addressed about the forms, you know, is being a prophet and having these texts, which I can only read in English or German translation already, is it poetic language? If so, why? Uh, and I mean, if there's the vision, there's what you spoke about, you know, not wanting to do tropes, but there are all these tropes, all these images, and that's what, what made me wonder. So, yeah, just yeah. an opening question for you. Yeah, it's very interesting. I'm trying to think which path I should go down, because also you're talking about these images and I'm like back at the childbirth imagery. Um, but yeah, it, it's really interesting. I mean, I think in terms of authority, it's almost a question that I want to ask someone, like, how how much are the prophets invested in the project of their own authority? Like, I don't actually know. Um, I don't know, maybe Zach, you know, maybe someone in the room does know. Like, I, I'm not sure actually, like in my readings of them so far, no one wants to be a prophet. <laughs> like, or like, it's not something that, you know, it's not like a joyous thing. I guess that's what the poem that I write about today. It's like, stop giving me these words. I don't want them. I don't want to do this alone. Why do I have to be this singled out individual? Um, and also for what it's worth, I didn't mention this just as an aside, the prophecy that's received in the poem that I read today is the exact same prophecy that was received in the biblical text. Like I didn't make up the prophecy. It's the exact same one, almost word for word at many points. Um, so, so yeah, but I don't think this, like the thing is that the, the prophetic can't really come after God, it's with God, 
right? Like the prophetic is in conversation with the divine. God, prophecy can't happen after God is dead, right? That doesn't even make sense, right? Like the, the work of the prophet has to happen while the prophet is alive and engaging the question. So yeah, it's very interesting. Huh, yeah, I don't think I have more to say, but I will think about it. There are further questions in the chat. Um, but I do want to I do want to mention um, one aspect of the prophets that is important is that um, unlike in other traditions, the prophets don't actually have standing power after their prophecy. So, mm -hmm. so uh, we don't actually base halacha on them technically, only tangentially. Um, we base proofs of concepts on them, but not completely. And their prophecies are only good for the moment that they're prophesying, but not completely beyond that. So they kind of stand out in terms of clashes between Jewish uh, interpretation and other interpretation uh, based on how temporal they are in like what they're specifically confronting. Um, because in Christian tradition, these are supposed to be everlasting ideas. Um, even, even I think verses themselves are supposed to be interpreted in certain ways, uh, uh, throughout all time. And, and, and so there's, there's a lot of misinterpretation over, over how the role of the prophets goes in terms of its, if its effect and authority over time, it never, its authority never diminishes, but it's, it's specific kingdom of like what it has authority of is the moment that it exists in itself, largely speaking. So that is an important distinction to be made that I think is not always understood. That's super cool. Um, a sentence that I actually have it written on my desk behind me that I keep thinking is just prophecy is for the present. Like that's something that really came to me while writing these. Like, I don't know if it's for the future or for the past, like prophecy is for the present. I, that's just something that I've been holding um, in this process. Really cool. Yeah. So now we have uh, Mayor's uh, question in the chat. If you want to go. Um, to yeah, have I sensed the origin of Haftorah as a means of reading the book that is not to be read as part of your project? Yeah, so I, I, oh, thank you for this question. So this is actually a recent, um, hi Mayor, nice to meet you. Um, this is actually a recent thing that I, I was like looking into the origins of the Haftorah. Why do we read these books on this week and why? Nice to see your face. Um, and then I, during some research, I realized that we don't really, the origins of Haftorah is debated. Um, but then one, one, um, one understanding of it was Haftorah is from the Shoresh Liftor, like to release, to quit, to let go. Um, and one reason why they did that was because it was the last part of davening, the last part of prayer on, in the Shabbat services. So this was like read and then everyone left to eat Toland or whatever they do in Kiddush. Um, and I really liked this idea of the Haftorah being like the departed text, like the text from which you can depart. Um, and I was, I sort of, I'm thinking of sort of calling these a, as a collection, like departings, um, because I think that there's something really powerful about that that image like it's where it's where you end but where you end is also where you go forward right so um so for me that was a really big part of it and uh yeah and like I mentioned in the beginning the fact that these are just like you know the stories are not continuous when you read them week to week as one story it doesn't I'm like why are these connected at all you know and I haven't really necessarily been reading them alongside the Parsha so much I usually read the Parsha when I read um Zach's uh Parsha um, part of the newsletter is a Parsha tidbit. So that's when I get the news on the Parsha. I'm like, oh, that's what's happening. Or my friend Hila's newsletter, which she just started. She's in the chat, just a shout out. It's a great one. So, um, but yeah, definitely the Haftorah as like this weird discontinuous disputed origins thing was definitely part of the project. And also sort of helped me with this question of like, make it legitimate, even though maybe legitimate, but not authoritative is maybe a interesting line to stand on yeah yeah thank you um there's one other ah, okay another one from Ari um it seems the temple's highest priest wants to have me mourning how does the spiritual the holy the highest relate to the violence you spoke of and the messiness that you are wading through in your relationship to this land 
Yeah. So, I mean, what's interesting, Isaiah is a book um, that shares a lot of utopian visions, which I think is about, you know, the second half of that that sonnet, um, but it's when there's a ton of corruption in the temple um, and God opens just like totally bemoaning and pissed off and mad at all the Israelites for kind of like overusing it. There's like a line in there um, in the prophets. It's like, you know, enough with all these sacrifices. Like, what are you doing? Um, stop, <laughs> like stop with all these sacrifices if you're not actually gonna be like God fearing. Um, and that uh, feels quite relevant <laughs> to my life, um, to my understanding of life in this in this country right now. And I, I know that that's um, there's a lot of different interpretations of that, but you know, it's like, you know, what is Hashem? What is this ruach wanting us to do as we make these cycles again and again? And now we're the same people in some ways, in the same place, doing the same thing. So, um, yeah. But yeah, but also, like I mentioned a few times, I'm still in the midst of this cycle of writing. So like, I'm not finished yet. So I don't, there are many things that I don't even, I don't even know. They're just happening as I write. So yeah, yeah. Um, we're reaching, we're wrapping up an hour. I'm wondering if anyone has any more questions or comments, you're also welcome to just like open your mic and, and speak. I don't know if there's anything else in the chat. Oh, a comment from Alex. Thanks, Alex. Um, <laughs> thanks, Alex. <laughs> um, yeah, and thank you, Zach. A huge thank you to Zach for making this all happen. Um, Joelle, can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> how, go are you, how are you using the spiritual in your activism? Like for people who don't know Joelle personally here, she's a badass activist. She's always thinking through justice and politics and um, she's just um, doing it so deliberately and intelligently and intentionally. Um, and I was wondering, you know, having to wade through these haftora and think through um, the ethics of the ethics of what's being like raised in these kinds of stories and the ethics of your own spirituality. I wanna hear maybe a little bit more and push you a little bit more to hear about how you think through spirituality, how you think through the highest, how you think through like what's being raised here um, and how that's, how like your relationship to holiness and your relationship to spirituality has changed in terms of your politics and also in terms of like going through this 20 week process. Like, I want to hear a little bit more about like how, what holiness means in the, like to you, not from, not just what Isaiah is saying, like, what does it mean to you um, in the context of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis also? <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's all holiness. I don't know. None of it is not holiness, right? Like it's all in conversation with each other all the time. Um, I don't know what you do like, what do you do when holiness is violence, right? That's, oh, I don't, I don't know if I, I don't know if I stand by that question. I have to think about it later. Um, yeah, it's, it's all, I don't know. If, it's almost like the question of like the self versus the character or the prophetic versus the poetic versus authority and legitimacy. Like, are these things even different? Um, I don't know. I feel like ho holiness is a really big part of my life, but I also don't know if it's part of my life that I could truly, uh, you know, it's a very, very intimate, it's a very intimate holiness. I don't know if I could truly share that with others over Zoom. <laughs> you know, like it's a very, <laughs> it's a very private and very, a very intimate space that I, um, but it definitely is all holiness. You maybe get a little excerpt of some moments like that. Um, I can speak to, um, there is something so, so a deep breath from that. I didn't mean to go into like my whole little mystic thing, but um, I will say that some of the holiest spaces that I've found in the whole world that I've met so far, and I haven't met that much of the world. It's a really big world, but um, spaces of true um, solidarity when people who are 
meant to stay apart by all the systems around them, like the systems of capital, the systems of um, oppression, systems of government, like when people who are, who should have been forced to stay apart are able to come together and, you know, break bread, the glimmer space, I've spoken about this with Saba, I, in my mind, it's the glimmer space and it's the holiest space on earth. Like whenever I find a space where people are going against the odds to like prove that we care about each other's humanity and that that's enough, oof, that gets me going. Like that's that's really, really holy. And um, it's sort of an addictive part of what's become my, um, I guess my activism. It's like, it, I haven't always been an activist, but um, it's it's quite addictive. So yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Ari. Thanks for the love. Um, yeah. Thank you all so much for coming. I mean, there's so many people here who I, the spaces I didn't even see, and I'm so happy. I'm so honored that you guys even, even made it. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm very, I'm very grateful, uh, that you've, that you've been doing this. And I, I mean, I, I want to finish with a uh, sort of one comment, which is that, you know, I just, I just really believe that writing from the heart, if you have, especially if you have the form and the skills to do it, um, is supposed to be less of a literary piece and more of an experience that that you and the readers are going through. Um, I don't, I know, I just never saw poetry, especially because poetry, the words of poetry become prayer so often in Jewish tradition that yeah. they're not static they're 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 living and they're transforming us um and that's the experience I get a lot of the time when I read your poetry um I hope people read uh read more um I posted the uh the link to our newsletter or to how to sign up to it uh in the chat um this has been recorded so uh this will come out at the very least um, as a podcast form. Um, and I want to say thank you also very much for coming. And thank you again very much, Joel. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Zach. This has been like, it, like if this is what I do in my life as a writer, like this is enough. So it's pretty cool. So thank you so much. And there's at least four more poems. So you should sign up for the newsletter because also Zach writes a great Dvar Torah. And there's some really cool interviews with people around LA. And if you're ever in Los Angeles, you should definitely stop by Dernister. It will save you from whatever existential spiral you find yourself in. <laughs> and those that have been there definitely know what I'm talking about. So yeah. <laughs>